Finally, during each Presbytery meeting, the Presbytery Advancement Committee is trying to offer a brief presentation that just might be useful for you. And today, Matt Camlin is going to be doing that presentation. Thanks. So when Beth Creek Palm volunteered me for this uh, job tonight, um, she asked me if I would come and present a outside of the box model for finding pastoral leadership for your congregation because it's one of the problems that we're having not only in this presbytery but in many presbyteries we've got lots of little churches who can't afford pastors and what's a congregation to do i told her no i will not provide one model i'm going to provide two so I was delighted to find in uh, the summary of the fireside chats the question, should congregations begin pairing with others to provide full-time calls for pastors? I have spent 20 years in pastoral, 21 years in pastoral ministry and was paying attention long before that, and I have never heard any church anywhere say, you know what we really need? We need to yoke with another congregation, we need to pair with another congregation and share our pastor. And every time I've ever suggested it in my 21 years, people look at me like I'm nuts. So let me tell you a little story. I started uh, my time in the Upper Ohio Valley Presbytery by becoming the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Chester, West Virginia. And I wasn't there six months before the, the First Presbyterian Church of Newell, West Virginia, six miles downriver, uh, approached me at a presbytery meeting and said, would you ever consider preaching twice on a Sunday? And I said, well, as luck should have it, our general presbyter actually told me to anticipate that question, and so I've already thought about it. And the answer is yes, but we're going to need to talk, I'm going to need to talk to my session about it first. First Presbyterian Church in Chester uh, actually thought it was a great idea, not because they were going to be able to share the cost, because that wasn't what this was about. It was because they saw it as a way of supporting a smaller congregation that didn't have the money for a pastor. I also happened to notice that right after that first question in this is this question. Or could churches with more resources make use of our connectional nature and financially support a church on the verge as a mission project? That is precisely what my first church in West Virginia did. So I was the pastor of two churches for a couple of years, and one of them, the, the larger church, had ah, 80 members maybe. The other congregation had 18 on the books, 12 on a typical Sunday morning. And so I would go to the little church first, I would preach there, and then I would come back and I would preach at the larger church. Worked out fine for a couple of years. One day I got a phone call from an elder at a third church that was out in the country a little ways, Fairview Presbyterian Church, and they said, we have a crazy idea. Would you ever consider uh, taking on a third church? And I said, I think you're crazy. And they said, well, hear us out. We have, a, we have kind of a harebrained idea. Okay, I'm listening. And she said, what if we all worshipped together like we were one congregation, and then you'd only have to preach once? She had my attention. So the plan was, we will, I, will, I will be the pastor of all three congregations. All three congregations will continue to have their own sessions, and they would, eat, they would each pay me separately, and we, we came up with a scheme for what that would look like. Uh, but what we had to do in order to all worship uh, together as a congregation was choose a location, right? Isn't that always the sticky wicket? This model of ministry I'd like to call the nomadic parish model. <laughs> because here's what we did. Every month, we would choose a different church building, and we would go in a rotation month by month from the first church to the second church to the third church and back around. 
We got to spend time in each other's spaces. We got to uh, experience one another's uh, traditions because whatever church we were in, that's how we did communion while we were there. Whatever you guys usually do, that's what we're going to do. Wherever you guys usually have Sunday school, that's where we're going to have Sunday school. Where Whatever uh, music you, whatever hymnal you use, whatever music you're accustomed to, that's how we're going to worship for this month, right? So we all got to know each other. We had fellowship events and all those kinds of things. And ultimately what we decided to do was form what we called the parish council, which was all of the, pa- all of the uh, sessions meeting together for the purpose of discerning Is God calling these three congregations to essentially close and create one new congregation? That was an 18-month discernment process. We didn't do it in a few weeks. And my my only caveat to all of that was that in that discernment process at each of our meetings, if I ever felt as though someone in the meeting around the table was pushing a personal agenda, advocating for their congregation's way of doing things or choosing their building over the others as our final resting place. That's a very bad way to put that. Our final, our final uh, place of worship. Uh, if I ever felt like they were trying to push a personal agenda instead of discerning God's will, I reserve the right to immediately adjourn the meeting and we all go home. Because what I said was, I don't care what you want. My only interest is in what God wants for these three congregations. If that's merger, great. If it's not, fine. But I don't care what you want. That's not why I'm here. 18 months later, we had three separate uh congregational meetings that all took place simultaneously, and I moderated none of them. Uh, I got friends from the presbytery to come and moderate these three meetings. It took some time, uh, but in the end, the three congregations simultaneously voted yes, and our congregation became the Trinity Parish Presbyterian Church in Chester, West Virginia. That's one model, and that took longer than I thought it would, so I'm going to go real fast with the second model. The second model that I... So think about that as a possibility. You don't have to merge, but you, st- but you see that over the course of like a two-year process, we were able to uh, accomplish a great deal, not only of getting to know one another and, and worshiping together in larger, and a, as a larger body, which meant we had a better choir and we had all of the things, right? We, it also meant that we were able to undertake a mission together that we could not have undertaken alone, which was we started a, a city, uh, co- uh, a community dinner that we served once a month to folks because we identified hunger as one of the primary concerns of people in our, in our area. So we would, spend, uh, we would spend time preparing and serving food once a month uh, out of the fire hall in town and just invited people to come and eat for absolutely nothing. Just come and eat our food. Uh, and then we also had other uh, government agencies and service organizations on site to provide other services as people came to eat their food. Second model, when I was in 2012, when I went to Malawi, Africa, I had the opportunity to see how they deal with their pastor situation. The problem there is that they can't build church buildings fast enough for the number of people who are becoming Christian. We all have that problem, don't we? (laughs) There, in their system, you are not even considered or called a church unless you have more than 200 people in worship on a Sunday morning. Anything less than 200 people is a prayer house. How many actual churches do we have in our presbytery at this point by Malawian standards? Like five or something maybe? Most of us pastor or attend church houses by Malawian standards, right? And so an an abusa, a pastor, would have at least two churches, sometimes three, and 
they would have all of the ancillary associated prayer houses out and around. So they may be, they may be pastoring as many as six to eight congregations total. Two of them would be churches of more than 200 members. The church that I visited had 800 members, and that was one of my hosts, two churches plus prayer houses. That's insane, right? No pastor in their right mind would do that. But here's the thing. The pastor was only responsible for the word and the sacrament and the occasional emergency pastoral visit, right? They would do, they, they did communion, they did baptisms, and they did weddings for legal reasons. And the elders of the church did everything else. They did all the pastoral care, they did all the visitation, they did all the education, they did every, they even did the funerals, because you didn't have to be a pastor to, to, to lead a funeral. They did all the things to make the churches and the congregations function and care for one another and lead the Bible studies and all the things. The pastor's job was to go from church to church and lead communion and baptize people and, marry, and, and perform wedding ceremonies. That's all the pastor, frankly, had time for, and you can imagine why. So two different models, the nomadic, uh, the nomadic parish model uh, or the Malawian model, where I envision us perhaps uh, involving more CREs, commissioned ruling elders, in serving small churches under the under the supervision or the leadership or the or uh, sort of co-ministering with a pastor who might be the pastor of four little churches, but it, it, when that pastor is not able to be at any given church. A, a CRE partnered with them would be there in, in his stead or her stead. So we need to think outside of the box about how do we continue to support our small churches when they can't afford a pastor and they're just not ready to have the conversation of closing. And if you want to talk to me about either of those models in further detail, uh, I'm in the directory, and I'm the pastor of the New Wilmington Presbyterian Church, and so you can find me there. Thank you.